Welcome to the Doctor Patient Forum, a no holds barred patient advocacy podcast discussing why millions of pain patients continue to suffer, but most importantly, who caused the suffering. Join us weekly as we discuss how you can help end the untreated pain crisis. We would like to thank everyone who has helped support our efforts by subscribing to our Patreon page. If you're interested in checking it out, it's patreon.com slash the doctor patient forum. As always, we're going to give a quick shout out to our new patrons who've signed up since our last podcast episode. So a huge shout out and thank you to John, Carla, Linda, Jared, Cynthia, Kathy, Sarah, LJ, Kimberly, Anthony, Susan, Barry, Paula, Lindsay, Shannon, Paula, Kathleen, Robin, Michael, Margie, Zoe, Laura, Susan, T, Kelly, Beth, Donna, Jen, Rick, Lisa, Gina, Judy, Kathy, Karen, Teresa, May, Patty, Cynthia, Teresa, Cindy, CJ, Shauna, Christopher, John, Naomi, Gary, Heather, Slam, Nancy, Red Dog, Fog, D, Eve, Reese, Lisa, Sean, Chris, Elizabeth, Charlotte, Danielle, Amanda, Brandon, Lisa, Kim, Lee, Lori, Amy, D, Stefania, Julia, Emily, Lisa, Marcello, Angela, Lisa, Ronnie, Stacy, Kimberly, Dave, Janet, Charlotte, Gwenny, Karen, Joanne, Elaine, Paige, and Rick. Thank you all so much for your support, and I hope you're enjoying the Patreon page. I'm going to give a bit of a disclaimer before we get into this episode. This is part three and the final episode of our Opioid Rapid Response Program, ORRP, series that we've done explaining our interaction with the program and what they claim they do and what they actually do. And I just, I just want to say a few things. Uh, before we get into this episode. Normally, I'm able to keep kind of a level head and I do get worked up about this issue, obviously, because I'm passionate about it, but I'm usually able to stay pretty calm. In this episode, I get really upset. Things have been rough for pain patients for a long time. And, you know, we get suicide notes and we hear patients cry daily and every single day hearing people tell us their plans to die who these aren't people who are really suicidal they're just in so much pain and they're so desperate and people with young children talking about they're gonna have to leave because they can't do this anymore so I do get really upset in this episode you'll hear me talking about it but Sometimes they get frustrated with the experts and those with grants and funding and academia because they mean well, but they sit around and just discuss things to death in this hypothetical way while nothing's actually being applied in the real world. And if we had 20 years for them to do it, I would understand, but we don't. I feel like this is such an urgent need right now something has to be done about patients being cut off or abandoned because not a day goes by that we don't hear from more patients who lose their doctor for one reason or another. I mean, every day I wake up and look at my email and it's the very first thing I see is another patient who is desperate and contacting us. And we're we're so many people's last hope and it's hard. It's just really, really difficult to know that people are suffering so much and n- no solutions are being given. And that's what we're trying to do at the Doctor Patient Forum. We are trying to find solutions to this problem. The problem has been very well established. We don't need to figure out why it happened. We don't need to figure out what is happening. We don't need to study anymore how dangerous it is to cut people off. We know all of that. We need to figure out what to do to stop it. That's where I get frustrated. So I just want to make it clear that my frustration is not that ORRP exists. In fact, I was so excited when I saw that it existed. And I'm not even frustrated that it doesn't work. I'm frustrated that they're not throwing in the towel and figuring out something that does work. I'm frustrated that they continue to claim that it works when it's actually not working. And I do want to make a request. If you've been cut off, if you've been affected by this, or if a loved one has been affected by this, please reach out to your local senator. Take that anger and frustration and fear and reach out to your federal senator, your local legislator, your local rep. Let them know what's happening and tell them that 
We need help. We need every single person to reach out to their senators. Please don't reach out to ORRP or CDC and send them like a nasty email. Of course, if your doctor is closing, that's what they're there for. By all means, email them and let them know and see what they could do to help. But reaching out to them to vent to them about your frustration, it, I think it would be much better to just reach out to your legislators and people who might be able to actually do something to help because I don't think the CDC is equipped to help at all. I think this is a program that in theory could work, but it's never going to work until we're able to get the DEA and regulatory agencies to lay off of doctors. We say this all the time. If you can figure things out as much as you want on how to set it up for doctors to take these patients. But if, if they're too afraid to do it, it's not going to work. And if you can't guarantee that a doctor's not going to get in trouble, why would they ever take an abandoned patient? And that's basically where we are. So I just wanted to give this disclaimer because when I was editing it, I realized how angry I sounded in this episode. And I was going to cut a lot of it out. But you know what? I am angry because every day we hear from people who want to die. We hear from people who want to die and then have killed themselves after, um, like happened with Danny. And I, I want to do everything I can to prevent that from happening anymore. And sometimes I feel like we're screaming and nobody's listening. So anyway, I just wanted to give that tiny disclaimer to you. And uh, we do appreciate your support. We appreciate your uh, listening to our podcast and going to our Patreon page, and we are making progress. We have a meeting with a senator coming up. So we have things in the works that hopefully we can make even more progress. But we appreciate you guys so much, and just thank you for listening. Okay, so this is part three of the opioid rapid response podcast. And basically, opioid rapid response is a program that was created to help abandoned pain patients find continuity of care. And we have put out two prior episodes just yep. discussing opioid rapid response program. Yeah, so the, the first episode was an intro to it where I went through the entire history of what happened, how we found out about it and our re interaction with them and how they banned us from webinars uh, and all of that. That was uh, part one in the intro. And part two that we recorded recently was we listened to recordings of them claiming that this is a program that works like that they, and we, we listened to many different people say it over many different years claiming that this works. And today I'm gonna play some recordings from different webinars, again, about ORRP from, I always forget what this stands for, ASTO, Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. This is a nonprofit that has joined with Opioid Rapid Response Program at the CDC to do webinars, I guess, and, and clinic closures. They're the ones who prepare, they prepare clinics, states for clinic closures. They play uh, role-playing. They do tabletop exercises where they role-play to prepare them for if it were to happen. And so... I mean, I, w I, I was kind of rude when I spoke to them. I was like, so while you're playing games, like we're actually trying to get people to not kill themselves. And she didn't like that too much. But I mean, but that's what's happening. They play games. Like, what do you mean you're preparing? Like, but then when you never go and do it, you're just always preparing. These people. Are there doctors in that nonprofit or are they public health people? I think they're public health people. And then I think they hire doctors and then Project Echo, they that is run by doctors. All right. So this first group that I'm going to play today is from ASTO and ORRP. And they were talking about what happens when clinics close and struggles that they come up against. This first one, I believe someone was asking a question because in this webinar, they're telling these doctors who are in the webinar to take abandoned patients, basically. So let's listen to this question. I think this is that one. Uh, Valeria from New Jersey and Dr. Kaufman, um, thank you so much for the presentation. I serve as a single state agency here and we work alongside with our colleagues at, out of our Office of the Attorney General's Office and the um, Department of Health. 
as well. And, and aligned with uh, what we were saying in terms of the, the questions or the challenges, that's what we face here is that, you know, the providers, it's hard to find a provider to maybe to take on these patients. And I mean, I think that the, the correspondence that you just referenced might even be helpful if we're able to kind of take a look at that, maybe adapt that here and have the, like, I'm not under the authority where I can say there won't be any you know, <laughs> it's, that's not under my authority, but if we can get the, the, um, the entities here in New Jersey who would have that authority, you know, to sign off on a correspondence like that, I think that would be helpful. Um, is that correspondence also signed off on by the DEA who actually is going in and, and conducting these investigations? Because I think if the DEA is not signing off along with us, I think it, it, the provider may not feel as much comfort in that correspondence. That is not signed off by the DEA, um, so uh, but it, only the uh, California Department of Public Health and the and the Medical Board of California. The you know, I, and I know it's 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 a tough message to get across to providers, but in general, the DEA isn't going after you know a provider who has like a single death related to you know they've got. He's wrong. That's Philip Coffin. And he's actually a public health person. He has been in harm reduction for decades. And they were presenting, discussing how in California, they had, I think they, the medical board or someone sent letters to the doctor saying it's okay to take these patients. And that woman from from New Jersey is right. She's like, yeah, but is the DEA signing off on that too? Because these doctors are scared. And they're like, no, that's the whole problem. I mean, it goes down back to that, that whole issue. Like, who is getting the DEA to back off? Because if they're not, everything they're doing is is irrelevant, in my opinion. Don't you think? Is that ASTO, Beth? Yeah, this is ORRP. I think they joined with ASTO. This is a presentation with ASTO, ORRP. And then they had some doctors just attend to, to watch this webinar and ask questions. And they were presenting Opioid Rapid Response Program. Um, it was just a few years ago, actually, when this one came out. I think it was 2021 when this uh, set of videos came out. And originally, this set of videos, there were like five of them, were public. And then they removed the links and made them private, unlisted. But we still have the links, so we have access to it. I don't know if they've removed it because we keep posting clips about it. I'm not sure. I have a feeling it might be one of the reasons. They still don't address the whole issue, right? You can tell t- tell doctors, take patients, don't force taper, don't abandon them. But no one's addressing the issue. Like, how do you make mm-hmm. that happen? No one is connecting these two things. And it's really getting on my nerves because they continue to say the same thing. They continue to get funding to say the same thing and nothing is helping these people. It's disgusting. Mm-hmm. All right. So this next quote is that she's speaking. I think it was after that uh, woman asked a question um, from DEA. So they didn't issue, you know, basically they expressed that to us and said in an email that we could pass that message directly on. You know, they're just, they're going to be very careful. It's, you know, and I said to the clinicians too, this isn't a get out of jail free card. You know, it doesn't mean you can just do anything. Um, as Dr. Coffin said, you know, and says repeatedly, I mean, documentation is key, but we are also through the ORP, you know, doing a lot of education to the regulators, to the, um, to the federal um, investigators also about just having realistic expectations about what happens to the patients and what care continuity truly means in these situations. So again, I think that there are, um, we're making headway and there is that kind of communication that can be directed at um, clinics and clinicians who are inheriting patients. So what she's talking about, it's a very same story she told me on the phone that in New York, she said there was a clinic closure. It wasn't because of the DEA. It was because the doctors just decided they didn't want to to see these pain patients anymore. I assume they thought it was too dangerous. And so she said it was the success because the DEA allowed her to pass on this information that it's okay to take on these patients, that you're not going to get in trouble. But she said those same words to me on the phone that she said here, but that doesn't mean it's a get out of jail free card. It's not like you could just give them whatever you want or whatever they want. And then she says something that's so important where she says, uh, we need to define what care continuity means. So what the evidence shows is care continuity means whatever the patient is on, regardless of dose or duration or combination, at least to start, you got to give that to the patient. But, but they can't because but they can't that's because right. the, net, the net doctor is going to get 
investigated. But the fact that they changed the definition of right, care continuity, right, right. they can continue to claim, yeah, we, we push continuity of care, but it's their definition of continuity of care. Right. This next clip is from, you know, Karen, C-A-R-O-N, it's a treatment facility, like a rehab or treatment center. And Karen is the one who has the uh, chronic pain anonymous. They have their pain management program where it's like a 12 step program about how to deal with chronic pain. And so this is another also put on by ASTO and they're discussing this. What can we do when, when we get those patients and listen, this guy, I can't stand this guy. He's terrible. Terribly. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I just had a quick question is how do you talk to practitioners related to potentially taking on, you know, patients that are on high doses of opioids or are or potentially taking on someone that has, that has left a practice of another pain management provider and where that stigma is attached to, um, that they're just a drug seeker or they, they have pill seeking, um, uh, tendencies. How do we cross that barrier with, uh, clinicians and, getting them to take on these, these um, very potentially problematic patients or complex, I should say, not problematic. Yes, problematic. Complex patients. Because, you know, pain is pain. Complex. You know, the way we look at pain. This guy is a yeah. jerk. Yeah. Who's that cute? Who's that cute guy that was? Just he talking? was actually a. Re he's just a. I think he's just a physician. He's a reasonable doctor asking a very reasonable question, trying to be respectful. This doctor right here is atrocious. I, I, he's, he's so bad, but listen to what he says about it. So and who is it? Who is this doctor? Oh gosh, I forget his name. I'll get it for you after he's from C Karen, C A R O N, but listen to how he answers it. I'm going to rewind it a second. Cause you know, pain is pain. You know, the way we look at pain, we have a chronic pain program here at Karen and we, if someone says they have pain, we believe them, right? So pain is pain. It's subjective and we believe them. So we want to address that. Um, I think the important thing to understand is that we also have to educate providers that the medicine itself causes pain. Did you get that? The medicine itself causes pain. So the doctor's Bad. asking right. him, what uh -huh. do we do when right. these people maybe appear to be drug seeking? What do we do? And he doesn't answer the question. He says, you and teach he, the doctor that they're, the, the drug itself is the problem. Oh, opioid. He's talking about opioid induced hyperalgesia, I would yeah, imagine. It's, it's yeah. Hyperalgesia, right? So if you've been on opioids at, at high morphine equivalents for a long time, chances are the medicine is now adding and amplifying your pain. So that needs to be discussed with the patient that if we start to reduce your medicine, we very well may be treating your pain. I'd love to know who this guy is. I'm just going to replay his quote in its entirety since we sort of interrupted the quote because I want you to hear exactly what he's saying. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Complex patients because, you know, pain is pain. You know, the way we look at pain, we have a chronic pain program here at Karen and we, if someone says they have pain, we believe them, right? So pain is pain. It's subjective and we believe them. So we want to address that. Um, I think the important thing to understand is that we also have to educate providers that the medicine itself causes pain. That's hyperalgesia, right? So if you've been on opioids at, at high morphine equivalents for a long time, chances are the medicine is now adding and amplifying your pain. So that needs to be discussed with the patient that if we start to reduce your medicine, we very well may be treating your pain. And we also have to fight to get other modalities, non-pharmacologic modalities approved by insurance companies. And then he goes on in the rest of that um, little clip there to praise uh, Chris Christie, by the way, with his work with No Pain Act. He, he's so proud yeah. of him because he did mm -hmm. it out of the goodness of his heart. So um, I have two more clips. The next two are still from that same video. So I think it's really, again, about education. Um, I know that physicians get really, they get worried because there are so many regulations right now. So if you inherit a patient on very high doses of opioids, high morphine equivalents, you invite regulators um, into your office, essentially. And that's something that, you know, I think we just, we need to educate these providers of how to have the conversation with the patient, not 
talking to an addicted patient, but to a chronic pain patient and let them know that the medicine itself may be part of the problem. And let's start to back off a little bit and layer services on with other medications that are non-addictive and other strategies that are not medications at all. We run a clinic. And then he goes on to talk about his clinic. So if you notice, again, people are asking him a question. What do we do when they take this patient? And the answer is always taper the patient. He's giving reasons why everyone should be tapered. Not one time in this entire video does he actually say, look, some patients might need to stay on what they've been on if they're stable. Everything is about taking the patient off and we're going to teach you how to do that. So the last question, yeah, if that one didn't make you angry, wait till you listen to this last quote. How do you talk to an addicted patient or how do you talk to a chronic pain patient and how do you reduce some of the, you know, how do you, you, you move the patient through uh, motivational interviewing techniques, CBT, things of that sort, to a place where they're okay with reducing their morphine equivalents and uh, perhaps even, uh, you know, with the end goal of getting them off altogether. Um, so I, I don't know if that... So did you get that, Claudia? The end goal is to get them off altogether. So here is Opioid Rapid Response Program claiming they help patients or they're their goal is to find doctors, help patients, find continuity of care, whatever the heck they say they do. And the doctors are having speaking. Everything is about getting the patients off of opioids. And even Stephanie, she's like, well, we need to redefine what continuity of care means. It doesn't mean giving them what they're on. It means getting them on a safer medication, getting them on a lower dose, blah, blah, blah. So I don't see anyone speaking about evidence here. What do you think? I mean, what do you think about what this guy said? It's all the same bullshit. Yeah. It's all the same bullshit. Yeah. Oh, oh, let's get it. How about Dr. Garbley? Should we send them to you, to your treatment center? Right? I'm, we'll I'm put sure. Him, let's, put, let's put them on some nice high doses of Suboxone and Gabapentin. Yeah. And I would love to know how much care and treatment center is actually getting from settlement funds, because I would imagine they're getting a good amount from settlement funds. What do you think? I mean, how I'm, much I'm are they getting? I don't know. It's a good question. I know that they, Karen has raised $7. million to fund ongoing research with Suboxone. It's all the same nonsense. It's all the same nonsense. I wonder how much Indivier is giving Karen. We should actually look in to see how much Indivier well, is giving Karen. I'm asking him. I'm asking him. Um, Pacer, I'm on his uh, LinkedIn right now. Good. The next group of quotes that we're, clips we're going to listen to is also from Asto. And here they're talking about the issue again of we can't find doctors for patients. And what do we do when we get those patients? And some of this stuff they say isn't all that bad, but let's just listen to what they say here. It can be really hard for patients who have been taking long-term opioids to find a physician who is willing and able and confident in being able to take them on as a patient. Um, it can be scary we are exploring the many reasons why uh, clinicians don't tend to want to take patients who have been taking opioids. Notice the giggle, again with the giggle, because yeah. it's so funny. It's always so funny. Claudia, they can stop exploring the many reasons because the, the there's one reason. They're afraid. Doctors are afraid. They're afraid of the regulatory agencies. They're afraid of the DEA, the DOJ, OIG. They are afraid. So stop spending money trying to figure out why they're afraid. They're, they're not taking these patients because you know what? We just listened to that 2005 C-SPAN video with Siobhan Reynolds. And she testified in 2005 saying DEA targets doctors who take the abandoned patients. So here we are almost 20 years later. Um, possibly due to fears of law enforcement um, action taken against them. Um, possibly uh, they just don't feel confident though in their ability to treat patients uh, on high dose opioids and care for them safely. We are exploring this issue, but we also really need to rely on all of you, everyone across the board to be encouraging folks to accept these patients and not abandon them because basically we can't have a situation where there's nowhere for them to go. But you do have that situation, Stephanie, and that's the problem. Stop addressing it in the hypothetical. We are so far beyond hypothetical. Right. We do right. have this situation. Where is their outrage with what's happening with pain patients? I don't see outrage, do you? Except for, for from- nobody. No. Where's the I, outrage? I see, well, no, I see outrage for addicts to have access to a safe supply. 
like Suboxone and safe needles and safe injection sensors, but I haven't seen any outrage for disabled person who uh, lost his leg serving our country. I haven't seen any outrage nope. for somebody who had her nope. breast removed and denied pain medication. And you know what? The only thing I get when I talk about that is people say, well, that's not happening. So they doubt the story. So it's, it's, you know, don't believe us because there's no way that's happening. You're just fear mongering. No, it's happening. It's happening everywhere. And if we don't take some time kind of pause to figure out the problem, we're just going to have overdoses go up and up because overdoses are continuing to go up. And that's with this huge increase in naloxone availability. Right. Imagine, so, imagine if there wasn't uh, Narcan. No, it would be it would be so many more. So that you know, it, it would be even worse. It just would be even worse. Okay, so this next quote is of Philip Coffin. He is a doctor again. He's an addiction specialist. He's out in California, and he has some kind of company, or he works with the with like the state medical board or the. Department of Health with this issue. And he, he he gives presentations about what to do with abandoned patients. And I normally like Philip Coffin. I do. But he's the one, we listened to a quote where he said, motivational interviewing in a crass way is getting the patient to do what you want them to do. And I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I think it's shady. It's cagey. And it's, it's not nice. It's, you wouldn't be allowed to speak about an addiction patient like that. Only pain patients this is reserved right, for. Right. So this is Philip Coffin in his presentation. So we know that the CDC and FDA, it's important to to have these, to be able to refer to these when you're working with providers. CDC and FDA do not want you to blankly follow these magic numbers or just stop pres prescribing opioids. It's recognized by our federal agencies that this is really, that it is really risky to do this. And it is helpful when working with providers to have these federal agency documents. So again, though, Claudia, it's the same talking points. 2019, the CDC and FDA released a clarification. They don't want you to just abandon these patients. Okay, now what? Okay, we, no we've one, established right. that for years. We're yes, four yes. years post that. Now what? I mean, it, just, it makes me so angry, but they still just continue to, to say the same thing. Uh, Valerie from New Jersey. We work alongside with our colleagues at out of our Office of the Attorney General's office. We're, we're having this conversation and all these cops are involved. These yeah. are cops. Yeah. Like the Attorney General's office, they hire yeah. former law enforcement to yeah. act as investigators. So yeah. we have cops who are practicing medicine. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Aligned with uh, what we were saying in terms of the questions or the challenges, that's what we face here is that, you know, the providers... It's hard to find a provider to maybe to take on these patients. So that's, we heard the rest of that quote where she's like, I, we can't tell the doctors you'll be safe if you take these patients. Did the DEA sign off on it? And Dr. Coffin said, no, the DEA didn't sign off on it. So how is this not setting a doctor up to be arrested. I mean, we saw the other day a Suboxone doctor was taken out by the DEA and found guilty and sentenced to prison. Yet right. you continue to see people advocating for unlimited Suboxone. So why would you advocate for unlimited Suboxone and not advocate for the DEA to stop going after Suboxone doctors? Because once they're through with our doctors, they're going to go after Suboxone doctors. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're not going to stop. They're just not going to stop unless, unless we, we, I mean, this is why we need money. We need lobbyists. We need to have a seat at the table. We need to have a presence in Washington because unless this issue with the DEA is addressed, nothing is going to help. Okay. So we have one more quote here from this section. Claudia, I don't know how they continue to get away with this stuff. Do you? Like, how, how do they continue to just get away with it? They have endless resources, so they can. So let me just play this last clip from this section. In terms of helping to allay the fears, yeah, I mean, that's that's a it's a mixed bag. There are providers out there who just aren't going to budge. They've made the decision, they're, and they, they're simplifying their life and getting away from this, and they're, they're not going to go back. They, in that circumstance, you might want to talk about the, uh, you know, managing use disorder topic because they're not going to prescribe opioids, but maybe you can get them into the managing use disorder um, side of it, and not, not opioids for pain. And then for the opioids for pain piece, it's this is where we've, we've been trying to build up the materials for it. 
documentation is the most important. I think, you know, some of the some of the actions that have happened where state regulators have gone to the site and and said to providers like we are we want you to take on the care of this patient. We're not going to question that you're going to, you know, continue to prescribe this benzodiazepine benzodiazepine and opioid to this patient when you inherit them. You know, you've got this window of opportunity. You've got this window where we're not going to question your care decisions at all. And, you know, to have regulators come straight out and say that <laughs> sure. is, right. is really important and bad, frankly, badly needed because you're not, you, think? And, you know, I'm trying to get that a little bit more in California. We, we, we got that. We got CDPH at one point, the California Department of Public Health and the California Medical Board to issue a statement that said uh, that we want you to take on the care of these patients and, and uh, not um, precipitously, you know, not necessarily taper or cut off opioids for these patients. It, it, that, that's a drop in the bucket compared to the years of investigations and, um, and the sense of being uh, assaulted that many of the providers have. And that's the thing, Claudia, they all know the issue. They skirt around the issue, right? They're like, yeah, we do. This is badly needed. We shouldn't force taper. Doctors won't take patients. We need to make sure they're not afraid. But I don't hear any solutions. Do you? No. I think the only solution is a federal law. Yeah. Like this is the law. You yeah. will not be prosecuted by the federal government yeah. if you take yeah. on abandoned pain patients. Yeah. That's the solution. Because the last two sections we're doing is really Stephanie explaining what the program, how it actually does work. And I think it might help for people to hear theoretically what they're wanting this program to do, but it doesn't work. So it, it's all, again, just theoretical. I, I, I don't know, Claudia, I, I just get so upset. You see these presentations and they fly across the world and present at these I they things, get, they get conference. Pain. Like, and there's a few pain advocates, right? There's an attorney to sit in a, a in a conference room and say, "Yes, uh, please don't cut off patients." And, and here we are. Yeah, it's unbelievable. It's absolutely unreal. And at this point, something needs to be done. I mean, something has to happen. This program does not work. It doesn't work. So they need to throw in the towel and say, it doesn't work. We need to figure out something that works. But you don't need to try to figure out why doctors don't take patients. Doctors don't take patients because they're afraid. That's it. They're afraid. So let's listen to a few quotes of Stephanie. This is also with ASTO. This was one of the webinars. And this is Stephanie talking about her program. Anyone new to these learning community calls also, I just want to share that the Opioid Rapid Response Program, which I lead at CDC, um, it is a federal program out of CDC in coordination with the U.S. Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health and the HHS Office of Inspector General. Our program staff are notified by investigators and agents, both from HHS OIG and our partners at DEA, about law enforcement actions that might disrupt patients' access to prescription medications, such as opioids and other controlled substances. Um, we then notify state health officials to try to support a state-led response to mitigate risk to affected patients. And I want to emphasize that the response activities that I'm going to be describing today really do come from, um, from you guys. Our job is often to basically take lessons, identify lessons learned um, in one state and disseminate them broadly and help kind of connect the dots and, and share information that really, and ideas and strategies that come from other state and local jurisdictions and spread that knowledge across the US. Uh, so I don't take credit for these uh, response activities, but I do uh, hope that <laughs> we can spread them as widely as possible so that folks <laughs> don't have to kind of start from square one if a, a notification comes your way and you so again, it's hypothetical. It's all hypothetical. Nothing is nothing is done. And it's not her fault because it's really the state's job to do it. And so this next clip, I think she mentions law enforcement in this clip. Like that when we get information from our law enforcement partners, you know, we we ask them for information about the prescribing patterns of the clinicians, what types of medications they're prescribing, at what doses, um, et cetera. And we also tend to ask them how far patients are traveling 
and what, if any, comorbidities patients may have, like substance use disorder. But when we ask those questions, what we're trying to figure out with limited information is who are these patients? Are many of them being treated for chronic pain? Are some already being treated for substance use disorder? Are some trading or selling their prescription medications or, um, for, for illicit drugs on the illicit market? In a perfect scenario, we would be able to identify how many patients are, say, stable on their medications, um, how many need some adjustments to their medications, and how many have a substance use disorder um, and or may need access to harm reduction or a treatment referral. Unfortunately, though, we never have that detailed information about the patients. And so what that means is that response efforts might need to address all the possible scenarios. So Claudia, here's the thing. She's acting as though these agents are so concerned and like they really want you have doctors that have been arrested that they literally talk to the agents and say, my patients are going to die. And they're like, don't worry about your addicts. They don't care. The doctors, what about Dr. Bauer? The prosecutor threatened to revoke his bail if he didn't stop trying to help his patients find new doctors. Like this is not reality. This is all hypothetical. Uh, it just makes me so angry. So let's start with on-site clinical care and harm reduction. So we've seen in jurisdictions in Connecticut, mobile units being used. Um, so SAMHSA or SOAR funded uh, mobile care units um, that could be present on the day of the action and even for a few weeks afterwards. The day of the, act, the action. with folks who can prescribe controlled substances, those who are X wavered so they can initiate patients onto buprenorphine, who take a harm reduction approach, understand the need that some of the patients, and we're going to talk about this, will probably keep coming up a few times today, but may not. So if they are taking opioids for, say, chronic pain, they may not necessarily self-identify as having any kind of substance use disorders, mm -hmm. um, and they very well may not have a substance use disorder. Taking an approach of meeting folks where they are, having behavioral and mental health care capabilities. Again, the flexibility and patient-centered care, recognizing that you don't, um, it's not advisable to force taper, suddenly abruptly discontinue a patient's opioid or benzodiazepine medications, recovery coaches on scene. And um, it'd be great if the individual or clinician that's on site um, has the ability to access the PDMP and can actually look to see what medications the patient has been. Again, Claudia, this is hypothetical because I it, it really is like going to, what if you go into a neighborhood where nobody has, has money, nobody has access to food and you start teaching them, this is how you make healthy meals for your children. And they're like, we don't have money for food. And they're like, well, that's okay. This is how you make, don't let them skip meals. And they're like, yeah. well, I don't, I can't because we don't have food. Well, it's a, just don't let them skip meals. It's not advisable. This is how you feed them. That's what's happening in my head. That's how I feel like this is happening. And it's almost like when I watch congressional hearings and uh, a senator or a rep is asking a CDC member a question or a DEA member or an FBI member. And they skirt and they yeah, can never that's right. That's right. answer the question. And what, no, you're still not answering my question. That's right. How many of those mobile units have prescribed oxycodone? I don't think any. And they tell the same stories uh, all the time. I think maybe one or two times in this whole history have they had mobile units. And it, as far as I can tell, it was probably just Suboxone. It wasn't for right. pain patients because they're not going to give a patient opioids. They're not going to give it right. to them. They're just not. Uh, unless it's Suboxone. Unless it's Suboxone, because that's an opioid. Yeah. But, you know, you and you heard, you heard Dr. Coffin. Well, you know, even if they don't want to give opioids, if they, they don't want to give pain medication, at least try to get them to give MOUD. And, and no, no, don't at least. Stop right. giving patients Suboxone when they're stable on a full agonist opioid. Stop. Oh, because they think, they think all pain patients are drug addicts. That's it. Well, they, they don't even think it. They they just they, it's they not even it. like it's their opinion. Yeah, they're like yeah, right. all, they're all. But they're 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 a different class of drug addicts because right, right. they are not willing to know. admit they're drug addicts. Right, and right. you know how the whole and I don't care. People are going to hate us for me for saying this, but you know the whole like progressive mentality of there's like the oppressed 
and the oppressors. And then Mm. if you're in the group of being the oppressed, then you're allowed to act however you want. And all the compassion goes to you. The thing is with pain patients, they've lumped us in with the Sacklers. So they always say the Sacklers said hammer on the abusers, hammer on the abusers. If that's what they said, it's terrible. And I think that is what they said. But But they also put us in that category, pain patients have blamed addicts. And that is part in their mind. That's part of the litigation. It is part of the litigation narrative. You've heard Barry Meyer say that, that pain patients act like they have the white hats. And then they look at drug addicts with the black hats. But I never looked at it like that. You're the ones who are saying that, but they view us as oppressors. So we're not allowed to be victims in their minds ever, because it'll never be as bad as it is for people other people with addiction. It's ridiculous. So there's one more quote here. And then the last group of quotes is them talking about the actual trusted contacts. Uh, For us on ORP, it's it's been a little bit different just because, I mean, we're dealing with kind of different populations. So in a lot of cases, these are individuals who are having their whole world turned upside down by losing access to their clinician who they trust, who they feel is treating their pain um, Stop it right back. You see what she just said? Who That they think. Yep. Right? They think. Right, right. That they think. Think it's um I believe, I believe that you believe. There you go. I believe she's that a, you believe it. A, she hates pain patients. She hates pain patients. She's and I don't a pain know, patient yeah. hater. Shame yeah. on you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Scared. It's a very traumatic experience. So um, in cases where we have clinicians on site, for instance, on the at the time that there's a disruption or a raid of a clinic, some patients run the other direction. Some patients are incredibly grateful. Some patients immediately know the risks that they're going to, you know, of withdrawal and others are just learning. Oh my God, I didn't even know the risks of suddenly stopping taking my benzodiazepine. Um, we had there, we published one case study on this. It was a case in Connecticut where, you know, several patients just voluntarily um, admitted themselves to area hospitals for uh, monitored withdrawal from benzodiazepines on that very day. But it, it, it runs the gamut. So it's very different. Every- Again, with the giggle. The, 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 the laugh. What is so <laughs> funny? Like- it runs. <laughs> they had to, Stephanie, because they would have died. Yeah. They would have died yeah. because you arrested their doctor. Yeah. A little bit different. Every jurisdiction's different. Who is on site there to support them is different and their needs and their needs differ. From um, a partner's perspective, though, everyone is usually very grateful that this program exists and that there's at least someone with the training to um, express that care and concern and compassion to the patients themselves, as opposed to historically having law enforcement really be being focused, you know, rightfully they're, they're focused on the investigation and the action being taken against the clinician, the doctor. So this is what she told me on the phone. She was like, Half the time, the patient just wants to know somebody cares. And I said, no, Stephanie, all the time, they want a doctor to be able to take over their care. They couldn't care less if you care about them. This is not about coddling a patient. This is about doing what's right and not, and not allowing them to be abandoned. So stop with the whole, oh, it's just, it's just expressing concern. No, no, that's not true. That's not what people want. Now, if they find a new doctor and they continue their medication, it would be nice if they were compassionate and not like nasty to them, but that's not what patients want. They want to be able to continue on their medication that they're stable on. Do you see how sick they are? Do you think she convinces herself that Danny Elliott blowing his head off was because he just needed a friend? Probably. Okay. So in that, in that phone call that I spoke about in the first part of this series, she was so offended. She was, cause she kept saying, we've made so much progress. And I was like, tell me what that progress is. And she's like, we've done amazing work. I'm so proud of it. And I'm like, okay, great. Tell me what that is. How do I access your program? And she's like, you know what, Beth? It's really hard to hear what the hell have you been doing? And I was like, I actually didn't even say that a little bit. I didn't even say that at all. I didn't say, what the hell are you doing? You told me you made progress. You told me great things are happening. I'm asking you what those are. Right. And so then she told me about the trusted contacts. And this last group of quotes is from a, a, a recent series. The sound is not great. It was their their own YouTube recording wasn't good. So um, 
there's really hard S's and stuff like that. We'll just have to deal with it. But this was within the last six months, this series about trusted contacts with Asto, because she told me how amazing their trusted contacts are. I, I emailed the Rhode Island Health Department with my lobbyist on the email and Senator Val Lawson. They've never heard of the Opioid Rapid Response Program. Yeah. Never. No, and there's supposed to be two trusted contacts in each state. And I was given a name of someone in North Carolina who supposedly was one of the trusted contacts. And um, I did speak with her. And what she, I was like, this is great. And she's like, well, is there any way, like, do you have a program where these patients can get help? She's like, I don't, I'm not sure. Is there something that, that can, you can do for them? I'm like, what? Right. What What are you talking about? Yeah, is there yeah, such, she was very yeah. nice, but yeah. what? I know, like, I know. Yeah, same at the Rhode Island Health Department. They're like, opioid rapid who? What is it? They're, huh? And, and I, these people, they have no idea that bureaucrats are the dumbest human beings God ever created. And they get yeah. paid well. Like, these are bureaucrats, your public health specialist. These are uh, people with a master's degree in ugats, nada, <laughs> stupidity. I mean, I don't understand. I don't understand. This is not, a, you, look, if this were still 2017 and 18, where people didn't know, everybody knows what's going on. Every day we hear from patients who have been abandoned. It's always the same email. Sometimes they want to die. Sometimes they go to the street. Sometimes they just lose everything and start drinking when they've never had any alcohol before. And, you know, they're dying. And that's a good, I think it is a good part of the overdoses, but, but they're not going to, we're not going to know that. I mean, and they did just do that one study where they did link the PDMP to mortality data, which was great for that one study. But we need that in every single state. We need to take some of the settlement funds, give it to an actual researcher who can link the PDMP to mortality data. And we could say, okay, Dr. Henson was shut down here. He has 300 patients. Let's see in a month, six months, 12 months, two years, how many died? How many died? How many were cut off immediately? Because you can see it in the PDMP. You can see what they get. The PDMP already calculates MME. So you wouldn't even have to put that in as a formula. So why can't we see how many went from 200 to zero in one night? And then how many of those people died? They don't want to study it. They don't want to study it because they know what it's going to show. And nobody knows what to do. You know, remember I asked that yeah. in the White House? He said, yeah. well, what, do you, what, what should we do? And I was like, huh? That's when I realized... Nobody knows no. what's going on. No. And when I talked to our medical board, the, the uh, CMO, mm -hmm. she was fabulous and she was kind. And Nab and I went to go speak, but it's been like radio silence since then. And basically what I got from her is that she's ready to make a change, but the lawyers on our medical board are not ready for there to be a change. And so, you know, they're still going after doctors and doctors are still abandoning patients. And I sent the state medical board in North Carolina, that, that podcast with Casey. I was like, I want you to listen to this. This is this is what's happening in North Carolina, but I don't ever get it. They don't respond. No. They they, no. they don't they don't respond. So this last series is just from Asto again within the last six months about the trusted contact. They're going to explain what this is for. An opioid prescription disruption is any event that halts the ability of a patient to access opioid prescriptions or medications for opioid use disorder, also known as MOUD. A disruption may occur for several reasons, including the death of a prescriber, retirement, resignation of a provider, medical license suspensions, or a federal or state law enforcement action taken against a prescriber, often resulting in a partial or, or full closure of the practice. This, these temporary or permanent disruption events can be dangerous for displaced patients who face an increased risk for negative physical and mental health effects, including feelings of abandonment, depression, and symptoms of withdrawal. This can be especially dangerous for patients with a physical dependency on opioids or opioid use disorder. In the absence of continued care, disruptions could lead to increases in drug seeking, drug diversion, illicit drug use, overdose, or death among displaced patients. With the changing landscape in the illicit market, disruptions have become a more urgent and pressing issue as fentanyl and counterfeit prescription pills have created a more deadly supply. So here you see that they're not only saying that they that this is helping for law enforcement. This is for anything, retirement, death, voluntary closure. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, with the hypothetical, like these people are dying. So all they're showing me so far is they know that they're causing people to die, right? And here she's going to explain what the trusted contact does. 
State trusted contacts or trusted contacts typically include one individual from the state health department and another from the state behavioral health agency or substance use services agency. For example, state opioid treatment authorities or SOTAs, opioid program managers, health department directors or division chiefs. Trusted contacts serve as the point of contact for ORP and are entrusted with confidential law enforcement information prior to an action being taken against a prescriber. ORP works with the state health department and behavioral agency to determine who should be designated trusted contacts. ORP provides trusted contacts with information that can help them assess patient risk and direct services to mitigate the risk of overdose among patients and others in the community in the cases of diversion. Sensitive information related to the action is shared with trusted contacts only at the request of law enforcement agents. So did you get that? So mm -hmm. what she means is the agents dictate whether or not these patient, these uh, trusted contacts can even know anything about the issue because the number one focus of, of ORRP is to it, it protect the integrity of the investigation. Trusted yeah. contacts are notified of a disruption and based on the anticipated patient risks, needs, and location, they may determine which partners will be included as key response coordinators for this event. This response team is then in charge of effectively and efficiently mobilizing information and resources to ensure care continuity and access to services. Okay, so in those emails of the FOIA between Stephanie and everyone about us, she kept saying, oh, they don't, they're misunderstanding what our program is. We can't say that we ensure, ensure continuity. But she literally just said the program is to ensure care continuity. For displaced patients. During a disruption, the state trusted contacts are tasked with coordinating the response team to provide support during the day of and following the action to ensure care continuity and mitigation of risk. This includes notifying emergency departments and health systems to be aware of the potential increase in patients seeking prescriptions for opioids or withdrawing from their medications, ensuring ample amounts of naloxone are available to patients within the community, supporting displaced patients and transitioning their care over to new healthcare providers, offering bridge care and or transportation to services. Okay, so she says bridge care here. And that's the first time I've heard them actually say, I mean, Stephanie speaks about it in a hypothetical way that healthcare providers on scene can write prescriptions, but she literally just said bridge, bridge care. Have you ever heard any patient given bridge care at all? Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, the best I've heard is go to the emergency room so they could treat you like garbage. So let's see, there's two more quick clips. This one, she talks about the trusted contacts again. State trusted contacts also play a role in developing and or refining the state's response protocol to prepare for when these disruptions occur. So supposedly every state has two trusted contacts and they create a protocol for what happens when these disruptions occur. But we just found out, I mean, in our states, they don't even, they don't even, the trusted contact barely even knows they're a trusted contact. They don't, there's no protocol, not in my state. Your state doesn't even know anything about it. During various huh? stages of the response, right. the state trusted contacts and their team may reach out to ORP or ASTO for assistance as needed. So as okay. mentioned earlier, there are typically two trusted contacts per state, one from the behavioral health agency and the other from the public health agency. When responding to a disruption in opioid prescriptions, behavioral health and public health must work together to ensure that all available state resources are leveraged and communities are supported in a holistic manner. <laughs> When planning for disruption, the trusted contact focused on behavioral health may be more equipped to connect and coordinate with state or local hotlines like 988 or 211 and the substance use disorder treatment locators. They may also be able to develop a list of behavioral health resources, connect displaced patients with mental health providers, and provide on-site peer support. Displaced patients don't need mental health providers. Displaced patients need a doctor who can continue their medication. I'm, I'm so incredibly tired of this whole behavioral health. Oh, it makes me so angry. Mm. The trusted contact on the public health side may coordinate with local and community emergency rooms, pharmacies, and community-based organizations to ensure that the community has the capacity to support displaced patients when the disruption occurs. The public health side will also coordinate the, avail the availability of harm reduction services, deploy on-site mobile integrated health units, and develop any communication resources to alert patients, providers, and community members of the event. Trusted contacts would coordinate and work together to develop a response plan and leverage their networks to deploy resources as necessary. Okay, and then there's just one more here. Be behavioral health, you know, in Rhode Island, chronic pain now falls under behavioral health. 
Yeah, and I read an, I read a study yesterday where they listed it as behavioral health. And I'm going to tell you something. There's there's one video I was going to take clips from with Asto and ORP that I didn't because I'm going to actually listen to the whole thing while doing a reaction video. Because this this one video is with Highmark, Blue Cross Blue Shield Highmark. I think it's in Pennsylvania and they work with ORRP and they assign the behavioral health units as the one to follow these patients for a year after they're abandoned. And they consider it, they, they consider two things a success, Claudia. One, the number of patients who went into treatment, treatment for addiction, not for pain. Right. right. So number of people who went to treatment and Number of people who, and and then lowering their prescription that was also another uh, another level of success. So going on Suboxone, lower prescription opioids, lower MME, and entering behavioral health. These are their successes. This, this is what they consider successful because this is why I think this whole program is about Suboxone. I really do. I think of course it I think is. I think it's all just to get everyone on Suboxone. So and, there's one and, and cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah, and, and the weighted. Yep. Yeah. And the other thing, what's it called? The, uh, Motivate, the, you use yeah, motivational motivation. interviewing to get yeah. them to, like Philip Coffin says, in a cross way, to get them to do what you want them to do. So, And like Stephanie said, you meet them where they are. They're not always ready to admit yet that they have an addiction. They're not always ready because the stigma paid patients put on oh, people with opioid use disorder. <laughs> so you got to meet them where they are and kind of pretend <laughs> like you get it because right, they right, just right. want to know someone cares. I mean, that's it. Right, right. They don't. Oh so gosh. we're actually the bad guy because we don't want to be called drug addicts. Yes. We're the bad person. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I keep saying to people, I understand. I get it. Why it's, it's offensive to someone with addiction for a pain patient to say, wait a second, I'm not an addict. I, I, get, I, I, don't, I, I don't get it. I mean, it. I get it. I get why that might make them feel like, oh, well, you're acting like you're better than us. If people in harm reduction and addiction industry, if you have a problem with pain patients saying that we're not addicts, then go after the Controlled Substance Act. Now I sound like Linda Cheek or whatever, Helen Burrell. Go after the reason why pain patients are having to say that. Because every single single month doctors are forced to prove it and patients are forced to prove it or else we can't mm -hmm. get our medicine and they can go right. to jail so if you have mm -hmm. a problem with the fact that patients are saying we're not addicts then go after the reason as to why they're saying it don't go after the patients because they have no choice we have to say it we have to say mm -hmm. it every month we have to say it every month mm -hmm. we have to say no we're not misusing no we're not addicted blah 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 yeah. it, that's a yeah. great point i never thought of it like that so we get hammered because we don't want to be compared to being a drug addict, but in actuality, every month, pain patients are forced to prove that they yeah. are not drug addicts. So yes. the government created yeah. a crisis, and now yes. they're blaming the pain patients for the crisis that they created. Yeah, just like Dr. Stanton Peel said, I, that's my favorite thing ever, where he was I like, know. we're creating solutions to a crisis we invented, and the solutions we're creating are killing people. I and that's it. I can't remember all of that, but that's brilliant. He I invented a, We invented a crisis. There was no pain pill crisis. There was mm -hmm. absolutely no pain pill crisis at all. So they created it. And now because of that, they're making us say every month we're not addicts. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It's not fair. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost at my limit of the fact <laughs> of apologizing for pain patients and us yeah. putting stigma and us this and us that and us this. Like, how about... Right. You help us too. How about we, because mm -hmm. we're all one group except for when we're not, right? We're all one group when yeah, it benefits right. certain people. Right, But right, when yeah. it doesn't, no one even mentions us because, you know, yeah. we're just being patient. Now my cup, my cup runneth dry. So we're going to have one more quote and then we're done about uh, this trusted contacts. In addition to coordinating patient provider communications and referrals to support, trusted contacts are also tasked with assembling and ensuring proper resource provision and support the impacted community. This means that during the planning phase, trusted contacts must assess the infrastructure of the area. For example, transportation to new facilities or access to telehealth due to limited bandwidth may pose as a barrier to displaced patients, especially those located in rural areas. As mentioned earlier, when responding to a disruption, states may also consider identifying and deploying available mobile units, peer recovery specialists, and healthcare providers to serve as bridge healthcare staff. Given the workforce shortage and last lack of capacity among healthcare workers, it's imperative that the state build relationships and trust with these response partners to streamline and ensure that staff will be available to support these response efforts. 
Finally, to ensure care continuity, both in the immediate and interim, while patients transition to new providers, it's important that states ensure proper availability and distribution of harm reduction resources like naloxone and fentanyl test strips to impacted communities. So again, it's the to ensure care continuity. But who is ensuring care continuity? I mean, I don't, am I seeing this wrong? Or is this just a bunch of hypothetical nonsense that gets funding to do nothing but teach about what their program could do if it worked? And tabletop exercises. Role play. Let's role play. Let's pretend that it reminds me of when, when Livy was a baby, she was like literally two or three. And she was like, let's pretend that I'm a baby and you have to do laundry all day for me. And I was like, oh, because that's actually happening. So let's just do the laundry. And she's like, no, let's just pretend. So that's what this is like. Because because they're like, let's pretend that clinics are closing and practice what to do. But clinics are closing. How about we right. go to the <laughs> clinics and right. do it in real time and figure right, out what right. to do? Because- you know, the patients call us like we've had people I know that Anne Fuqua, like she's actually keeping track of when these clinics close. She's keeping track to the best of her ability of who is getting help. And she says the same thing that, you know, they're not right. They're not helping. She called and begged for help to ORP. She's they so wouldn't sweet. help her. I love her. I don't know, Claudia, but I'm getting angrier and angrier as time goes by. And all these settlement dollars are flowing into the states and no one's using it to talk about us. They just don't even talk about pain patients. And I don't like the term displaced patients. It's too nice. No. They weren't accidentally displaced like, like a rock fell in a cup and water accidentally spilled out. These are right. purposely, the, you're targeting these doctors on purpose, knowing you are going to abandon patients. And how do I know that you know? Because you have this bogus program here. You wouldn't have this bogus program here if you didn't know what you're doing. So you know what you're doing. You know it doesn't help. And you're still doing it. You still continue mm-hmm. to do it. And that's, you know, that's what bothers me. I, I It makes me really, really angry. And I don't know. I, I, I I don't know the solution other than we have to continue to raise money to get a lobbyist to go to, to DC. I don't, I don't know what else to do. I really, I mean, we have I'm, meeting to. With, I'm meeting with Senator Jack Reed and I'm going to ask him any suggestions, Senator? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, that's the thing. They act like we don't know what to do. This just, you know, we don't know what to do. We didn't know. You knew though. You did know. So stop saying you they didn't. On our, on our website under debunking lies under CDC, we have one section about the CDC and I included every letter and every recording I can find of doctors and specialists saying, if you put these through, people are going to die. You need to know that this is going to kill people. And Mm -hmm. all they did is discredit those people by saying they were industry funded. And this is why I think they're so frustrated with Stefan and his, his study. He's, he's not an expert witness. He doesn't Mm -hmm. take money from pharma. They can't Mm -hmm. just, he's not like, opioid zealot where he's like give it to everyone all the time there's actually nothing they could do to discredit him and i think Mm -hmm. that's why they're afraid they don't they don't want that study to go on because they know what it's going to show they know it's Mm going to show that they're killing people and they don't want that to happen so they're trying to get it to stop but did you see that clip with you berman Mm -hmm. how she was so angry what is so resentful for i'm gonna i'm gonna put out another video about her tomorrow She's, she's a liar. She she's actually making a pain pain. What I want to say, Adrian, yeah. do you want did you want to witness the suicide? I mean, that's that what it seems you feel better. And then my favorite thing is how she said in her little because you know she was on the panel in anonymous sister screening within the last few mm. months and mm. and in that one when she was because someone's like well then how do you know who to listen to for advice if everyone's industry funded and she's like well you you just have to go to those who aren't who has never taken money for pharma like shatterproof. And so I made a video about that. I made a clip of right. her saying it. And then I right. literally showed all the money that Shatterproof takes from pharma. Right. They're liars. These yeah. people just lie because they think Profession- that no one's listening. That's right. That's right. They're addicted to lying and money. And then if you fight back, uh, you're called an opioid advocate. Yep. We're opioid advocates, but we're not industry funded. We're nothing funded. That's right. And that drives them crazy too, because oh, they don't know what to do. Crazy, I know. Right? We don't take money from industry. We've never taken a grant. We survive on donations. So mm-hmm. now what? Now are you going to address, like, now that that's all out of the way, how right, about you address right. the next? actual, let's talk about the subject, which is. No, then they'll say that we're hateful. And then they'll say that they're afraid of us. And then when that doesn't work. Right. Then the they'll, angry patient they'll break trope. Up Right. They, now they're angry patients and we fear for our lives. But no, we're not angry. What How else about, have you got? What else? 
But it's almost like, and not just to make this political, but it's like when the, the liberals will say that Republicans are transphobic. No, when you call me, I don't ask you if you're black, white, rich, poor, Democrat or Republican. That's I right. help you. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, what else have you got? I'm yeah, fucking and believable. It is, it is unbelievable. Okay, folks, I hope you enjoyed this opioid rapid response series. Bev, you've dedicated thousands of hours to this. Nobody yeah. knew about the opioid rapid response program until you found it. Uh, and, you know, I know everybody's thankful. And folks, let us know, what do you think about this podcast? What do you think about the opioid rapid response program? Most importantly, what do you think that we should be doing that we're not doing? Once again, thank you for supporting all of our efforts. You folks keep fighting and we'll do the same. Thank you. As we said before, we have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash the doctor patient forum. If you've enjoyed this podcast and you would like to watch the full unedited video version of this podcast, please head on over there and check it out. Patreon.com slash the doctor patient forum. Thank you once again for listening to our podcast. If you're enjoying our podcast, please follow us on Spotify, leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and share with anyone that you think might benefit from this information. Just a quick disclaimer, the information contained in this podcast should not be considered medical or legal advice.